You can pull, I don't care, tell anybody you want to. Very reputable people that have known me for many years. And I'm just me. What you see is what you get. And I love my husband more than myself. The above testimony, recorded by the Georgia Police Forces in the United States, became an example of how greed works in a person's mind. Especially when it converges on uncontrollable factors and desires. This case also reveals how much horror can lie behind an apparent postcard of marital happiness. James Edward Conley was born on February 22, 1950 in Dayton, Montgomery County, Ohio. He was the son of Ruth Slack and John Conley. James had four other sisters and three brothers. His paternal grandfather, Fred Conley, had founded a successful company called Monarch Market Systems. He also invented one of the first price marking machines, and held some 300 patents. Instead of joining the family business, James had to make a name for himself in a new profession. So he became a chiropractor. He found the ideal place to start his career, North Georgia. From the beginning, James worked hard to build a successful and caring, holistic medicine company. In this venture, he had the invaluable help of Bonnie White. As Bonnie herself has revealed, James' human qualities were key to gaining a loyal clientele. With his business growing every year, James knew he needed more employees. It was then that a young 21-year-old woman applied for the job and was selected. She was to be in charge of the company's reception. Her name was Teresa Lynn Boggs. Originally from Harlem, Kentucky, Teresa was known to have been raised in a somewhat conservative environment. There was a 20-year age difference between James and Teresa, but that did not prevent them from starting to date and falling in love in 1994. In 1996, they welcomed their first child, whom they named Caleb. For the father, it was a unique event. Just looking at him, he felt an overflow of love for the little boy. From then on, Teresa combined her work responsibilities with her household, trying to be the best possible mother for her son. A year later, James and Teresa got married. Additionally, they opened the Alpha Wellness Center in Dalton, Georgia, where Teresa worked as a massage therapist. According to Caleb, his mother had a drive and determination that was somewhat unusual, especially considering her background. Having become a friend of the couple, Bonnie witnessed the professional development of both. In 2000, James and Teresa's second and last child, Allison was born. Soon after, the family moved to a spacious and expensive house next to the tennis court in the quiet town of Ringgold, Georgia. The couple had a stable and happy marriage, and luckily money was not an issue. Thus, Caleb and Allison lived their first year surrounded by comfort and love. Christmas was Caleb's favorite time of the year. In order to protect himself and, by extension, his family, James at one point turned to Tom Drew, an insurance agent, to take out a half-million-dollar life insurance policy leaving Teresa as the sole beneficiary. In parallel, he also secured his home. But over time, this picture-perfect marriage began to fade, because some rumors began to circulate among the employees of the Alpha Wellness Center regarding infidelity in the Conley marriage. In the long run, everyone knew about it. Their affairs had been going on for a while, but they were getting worse. Another difficulty was added to the picture as financial problems began, when James suddenly became ill. He was diagnosed with Lyme disease, a condition that prevented him from working. Very soon after, Teresa became pregnant with her third child, but unfortunately, after undergoing four separate surgeries, the result was the loss of her son. The fateful event made things worse, and the mother was devastated and unable to take care of the business either. As a result, the debt soon became too much. After the loss of the unborn child and many other conflicts, Teresa suffered from depression, which led to her drug abuse. According to people who worked at the office, she became addicted to marijuana and methamphetamines. Around that time, Bonnie discovered that Teresa had also been embezzling money from the business. In one month, she had written 16 checks herself. When James confronted her in front of Bonnie, she denied everything, claiming that the checks had been cancelled. But in her role as accountant, Bonnie told James that the cancelled checks did not clear the bank, and then showed him the bank statement. The evidence left Teresa cornered. To make things worse, a new rumor began to gain traction among the couple's employees. In order to get him to agree, Teresa had been putting lithium in her husband's coffee. Although it was not fully clarified, the investigation indicated that the couple had considered the possibility of a divorce.
Mid-2007 The family situation became untenable. Both their cars had been seized, and James seemed noticeably affected by depression. The final blow came when the couple was notified that they were about to be evicted from their home for not paying the mortgage. However, Teresa had devised a plan, which although unorthodox, seemed to her like the final solution to all her crises, whether they were marital, financial or existential. She impersonated her husband, and wrote a letter in which she supposedly informed Agent Tom of James' decision to end his life, as the first step of her plan. Then, in the early hours of Friday, June 29, 2007, she was ready to put the rest of the plan into action. Sometime that morning, in the middle of the breakfast she traditionally shared with her husband, Teresa gave him up. By then, she had already arranged for a friend of hers to pick her and the children up. All that is known about this man is that his name was Robin. As soon as the medication began to take effect on James, the woman put the children in the car and left them in the care of her friend. Teresa then returned home and hurriedly put away some objects she considered valuable, such as photographs of her children, among others. She then started a fire between the kitchen area and one of the bedrooms. Both Caleb and his sister noticed that their mother was the last to leave the house, after which she began smoking. Just then, from inside the car, Caleb noticed smoke. Frightened, he tried to alert his mother. However, her response was that he had nothing to worry about, as it was just some papers that were burning. Not long after, Gary Carlock, the owner of a local grocery store, was on his way to his business when he saw smoke coming from the house and called the emergency number. About 11 kilometers away, firefighters with Engine 8 were just starting their day when they received the alert. At exactly 9.42 a.m. that day, firefighters showed up at the home. They immediately realized that it was impossible to stop the flames from the outside. So they decided to enter through the backside, right where a bedroom was located. As the firefighter scanned the room, a disturbing shape appeared on the screen. It was, without a doubt, the heat signature of a person through the smoke. It was James, and he was almost immediately pronounced dead. He was 57 years old. Unfortunately, the fire had wiped out everything in its path, any trace of DNA or forensic evidence of the crime, and officials initially ruled the death an accident. By the time, Georgia authorities reached Teresa by phone with the news. She was already out of town, on her way to visit her parents. Despite that wild and heartfelt reaction, minutes later, the first person Teresa called was the insurance agent. As for the children, they were completely devastated. They loved their father, and even in the midst of their troubles, he had never failed to constantly show them how important they were in his life. Meanwhile, as the news spread, the town's residents were in shock. A lengthy investigation was launched by the county sheriff's office and the fire marshal's office as well. With no leads to work on, the work became relatively slow. Teresa returned home in the evening and told authorities that she had left for Tennessee at 8.15, stopping at a restaurant for a bite to eat on the way. Robin was also interviewed, and while his account largely matched Teresa's, he said they had left a half hour later, at 8.45. As investigators continued to examine the house, a trained dog was brought in. The presence of an accelerant was discovered, placed right at the spot where the fire had originated. It was pretty clear that this was an arson attack, not an accidental one. Seeking to piece together an exact chronology of events, officers interviewed Teresa on July 5, 2007. During the videotaped exchange, the woman was at pains to make it clear that she loved her husband more than life itself. She also recounted financial difficulties that she attributed solely to James' illness, but overall she painted a picture of a marriage that was, if not perfect, at least loving and stable. James' friends and associates confirmed that as his health worsened, he stopped working and the business began to falter. The fact that things were not happening as he had imagined killed him inside, they said. He truly felt that he could not take care of his family, something that was impossible for him to bear. It was then that Tom contacted the authorities and told them that he had recently received a handwritten letter from James, in which he confessed his intentions to take his own life. However, investigators found it difficult to believe that he would choose this means to take his life, especially since it was extremely unusual to resort to such a means. It seemed like a real exaggeration. There were countless ways to make it much easier, less painful and less dramatic. Forensic analysis revealed the cause of death as smoke inhalation. Toxicology reports, meanwhile, 
indicated that James had been heavily sedated with antidepressants before the fire started. Additionally, burn marks on the soles of the victim's feet indicated that he had tried to put out the fire. Faced with such evidence, forensic psychologist Nita Sahi was adamant that it was a homicide. Detectives re-interviewed Robin about the discrepancies between her timeline and Teresa's. He did that after loading the children into the car, Teresa went back into the house and did not return for 15 to 20 minutes. The team's next task was to obtain the footage from the restaurant where they had stopped to eat. The photos showed Teresa and her children arriving at 9.17 a.m. that Friday. The family's home was less than a 10-minute drive away. As officers continued to investigate the timeline, they discovered that Teresa had been in the house when the fire started. As a result, police obtained a search warrant for the family home. Once there, they discovered many of the family's personal belongings that had been stored in an outside garage. There were also some divorce papers that had apparently never been filed that were also found in the residence. Later, they learned about the life insurance policy and the home insurance policy. As the officers focused on Teresa, they learned the details surrounding the loss of her last baby and her subsequent substance abuse. From then on, and adding the evidence found, she was considered the prime suspect. Interviewed again, the couple's employees told about the rumors of infidelity. So the police decided to summon Teresa again. In a second interview with the detectives, the woman not only appeared defensive, but began to change her narrative of the story. Suddenly her husband was a violent maniac, even saying that she believed James was capable of starting the fire himself, even if it meant the total destruction of the property. But although Teresa did not break, the detective doubled the bet and insisted. The medication found in James' bloodstream was the first topic that the agents wanted to cover, so they began by asking Teresa what medications her husband had taken. At first, she listed them without any problem, but when the detectives wanted to know which ones in particular made James sleepy, she suddenly forgot the names. Then the authorities played the insurance card, the amount of which they believed was more than enough to solve the woman's problems. However, Teresa's move was to play the victim and downplay the matter, replying that she did not even want to know the value of the insurance. It was clear that this would be a difficult job, and Teresa did not give in. The investigators then mentioned the presence of an accelerant at the crime scene. Once again, Teresa defended herself by saying that her husband had been painting the house a few days earlier, a justification for the substance. In fact, she suggested that it was what had caused the fire. They found it more than surprising that she mentioned that this could accelerate the flames. Furthermore, since she had said that they drank coffee together every morning, investigators thought that she had used this to give her husband a sedative, without him noticing anything. However, when talking about it, Teresa claimed that in the last few months, James did not have coffee for breakfast. This was clearly a major contradiction with what she had said a few minutes before, and this was pointed out to her. The woman continued to sink deeper and deeper, denying, retracting what she herself said and entering into contradictions. And the trap she set for herself was so big that she decided to settle the matter, asserting that whatever happened, the only thing certain was that her husband was her entire life. At that time, the evidence that the investigators had against her was nothing more than circumstantial, until one of them suggested that she be subjected to a polygraph test. Under the premise that she was capable of doing anything to prove that she had not taken her husband's life, Teresa accepted. However, before she could take the lie detector test, she had to sign a written stipulation stating that if she failed the test, the authorities could use it against her in court. At that moment, Teresa's main concern was no longer the fire. She was now worried that the detectives would know about the number of affairs she had been having behind her husband's back, because before taking a test, she wanted to know for sure how much information they had on the subject. Getting it wrong could have compromised her completely, but after the test was done, the computer indicated that her level of deception was over 100%. So, with the evidence added up, on July 9, 2007, Teresa, 34, was charged with malice murder, murder with intent, and two counts of first-degree arson. Her attorney then claimed that the fire had been planned jointly by her and her husband in an effort to improve their financial situation. With his mother arrested, Allison, then 6, and Caleb, then 11, were placed in the care of the Georgia Division of Children and Family Services. On July 16, Caleb was interviewed by detectives. The boy revealed the details of that morning, including his mother's return to the house once he and his sister were in the car. He added that right after that, he noticed smoke. Caleb said his parents often burned trash behind the house. 
investigators believed it was unlikely Teresa decided to do so just before leaving for the day. The most likely claim was that she drugged her husband that morning, then set fire to the bedroom while he lay in bed. As expected, the children faced a most difficult time, but while the disturbing experience deeply affected their young minds, they remained strong. Their maternal grandparents were later allowed to take custody, and later a court was kind enough to allow Teresa to visit them. While awaiting the court case against her in late July, Teresa was released from jail on bail. One of the conditions was that she live at the home of former Bucknell Police Chief Tim Henderson. In mid-January of the following year, 2008, when Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents searched the home, Teresa was charged with misdemeanor, marijuana possession, and placed under arrest. After a few days, she was released again, but shortly after was charged again, this time with possession of drug-related objects, driving with a suspended license, no insurance, and a headlight violation. She was released on $1,626 bail. The police then confronted Teresa with the evidence and made it clear that her children could be called to the stand as witnesses to testify against her. McCracken Poston, her defense attorney, originally asked the district attorney's office for a recommendation on a plea deal. The deputy district attorney investigated the case and, by her own admission, reached a fair and appropriate plea deal. Not wanting her children to go through such a traumatic experience, Teresa accepted the deal two days before the trial was set to begin. So, on the morning of Friday, December 10, 2010, a hearing was held. Sitting in a small, cramped conference room surrounded by her attorney, an assistant district attorney, a representative from the judicial circuit, and two media outlets. Teresa answered the judge's question asking her whether or not she pleaded guilty to aggravated homicide. She answered yes. Teresa then suggested to the trial court that she participated in the events as part of a financial conspiracy, but that she never intended for her husband to suffer any harm. She therefore begged the court to have mercy. The trial court accepted the statement. Reports say she was subsequently allowed more visits with her children. She was also convicted of first-degree arson, while the state agreed to drop the malice murder charges. Teresa Conley was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Currently, Teresa is still serving her original sentence in prison. She will be eligible for parole in 2041 when she will be 67 years old.